We were talking all things uh, metaverse earlier, or the very real opportunities for the virtual. We, we, I, I think there are real opportunities, but technology in many forms is, is, is transforming the way we do business and, and in the way that we provide people with homes. And we're now going to hear from three companies who are at the cutting edge of new technological solutions. Uh, each is going to get seven minutes uh, to pitch their idea, and then, uh, and then at the end, uh, hopefully before lunch, we'll have a chance to ask uh, a few difficult questions. Um, and first up, um, how 3D visualization will accelerate your sales and marketing strategy? So this follows neatly on from what we were hearing on the metaverse earlier. Um, and to convince you that this is something that is real, uh, the virtual has a real place to, uh, real part to play. Uh, we're going to have the managing director of Matterport, um, James Morris Manuel. James, do come up. Um, I, to add a little bit of jeopardy to this whole thing, I'm, I'm just going to say you've got 420 seconds, no more, okay? Uh, and your pitch can start now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how 3D visualization will accelerate your sales and marketing strategy. Focus the presentation today very heavily on just pure data and case study and evidence that we've got of how this is working and driving businesses forward. So if we jump to the next slide, please. Oh, do I get a clicker? So let's start with the digital twin. So here, this is a walkthrough of JLL in uh, Thailand. Clients got complete freedom to navigate through a property. They can judge size, space, dimensions, and they can also interact with the property by adding points of interest and other relevant data sources into the media. And the digital twin can be used across the whole property life cycle. So starting at the beginning, You've got a property that is in the design phase. You can come in, capture the property to be uh, redesigned. You can export CAD, BIM files from the media and put those into different softwares to be manipulated and, and create a design of a new design of a space. The second is the building phase. So the building phase, by using digital twins, gives the ability to build up an entire database of what was constructed and how it was constructed. So on the first week, you might do a capture as shell and core. The second week, the screed floor might have gone in. The third week, the plumbing. The fourth week, the electrics. And by capturing over a period of time, you can build up this database of what was created uh, and which uh, products were put in at which time. It also helps in the mitigation process of uh, the construction. Second is sales and marketing. So this could be for rental or for leasing, having the digital twin available, and I'll come on to some stats of where that's being used. Third is insurance, being able to really insure that space. So having a copy of what is there physically, if you do have a flood or a fire, being able to send that to the insurance company and uh, get your claim actioned much faster because you've got a before, this is what it looked like, and then after, this is the new digital twin once the uh, fire occurred. The next part is the operations of a building. So we're seeing a lot of facilities management uh, using digital twins. They're integrating the Internet of Things into the media. So if you've got a, a big residential building and you want to be able to manage the uh, where the fire extinguishers are or the HVAC system for air conditioning, you can integrate the Internet of Things into the media and you can see all of the different sensors inside your digital twin. And if this air conditioning unit is spitting out hot air, we know that there's a problem and it needs to be serviced. So really taking a digital copy of what's physically there and helping you operate that building. And the operation part of the life cycle is actually the longest part of the life cycle. So designing could take a year, building could take a year, sales and marketing, six months to a year. The operations could be 50 or 100 years. So really operating these buildings efficiently is, is very important. And then the last is repair. So we spoke about insurance. Again, being able to have you know, a copy of what was there before, followed by, you know, this is what was flooded or uh, got affected by fire. And going through that restoration process and repair process 
with the contractor. Okay. So here's some stats. 600% increase uh, in virtual viewings and virtual tours uh, have been achieved by Redfin. They are really growing quite quickly in their usage. And 87% of sellers said they would uh, found virtual tours and 3D walkthroughs more accurate than photos. You know, they say pictures tell a thousand words, but you know, virtual tours sell 10,000 words. 71% of buyers would uh, buy based on a 3D model only. The parallel to this, we are also seeing in, res in uh, rental sector where it's being heavily used in rentals where the market's moving much faster and people are willing to make a rental decision based on just the tour itself. 67% of agents said they attracted more serious buyers. 67% said they closed deals faster. At the moment with the current economic climate, everybody's really focused on, you know, top line revenue, operating costs, uh, being able to close deals faster is a very, very important one and the number is quite significant. 41% uh, reduced the number of in-person viewings. Everybody, pretty much everybody's got an ESG uh, goal, whether you're going for 10% reduction year over year or you're trying to get to net zero, being able to reduce your travel time, your in-car, your in-flight, in-train, whatever it might be, there are big savings towards your ESG goals. 39% closed deals at a higher price. We actually have other data that I've not got in here, but if you come and see us on the stand, we can talk through it, where we've seen property prices achieve 10% higher when there is a digital twin of that property. And that's because more buyers are able to see what's there. So you have a, a bigger, more validated pool of potential prospects. Okay. 80% of all respondents uh, would switch to an agent offering virtual tours and 3D tours. 80% would recommend these agents to friends, so big word of mouth saving. All right. Another case study here, 50% overall reduction in property visits, faster time to contracting. Now, obviously the most costly time for an owner or operator is the time that a property is vacant and reducing that vacancy period uh, is vital to speeding up that sales cycle. So, and then last one, two times more click-throughs for marketing email. So getting that marketing outreach and really getting more people coming to see that property. And that's it. Please come and see us. We're on the stand out here. Uh, if you've got any other questions. Thank you very much indeed to James. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I have to say my stopwatch didn't start quite as it should have done, but I think that was pretty close to seven minutes. Very well done. So we're going to do Q&A with everybody at the end. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Um, our second pitch uh, looks at how you can save time and money uh, with bespoke prop tech. Uh, and to explain all in seven minutes, yes, we hand over the... It's a bit like we've seen with the, with the, with the ceremonial mace, isn't it? Sort of passed over uh, to the next person. Uh, we have, for the next seven minutes, the director and founder of APT, Anna Bollinger. Seven minutes, go. Good afternoon. As um, has just been said, my name is Anna. I'm the director of APT. We are a bespoke web app and software development house in the north of England, but we also have offices in southwest China, which means that if you want to attract tenants from China, whether you work with Chinese stakeholders as well, we're able to help you navigate the differences between the digital landscape in the west and China, which are very different. But today, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of the trends we're observing within the prop tech sector and more specifically the um, bespoke development space. So, firstly, woo, why would somebody come to us for a bespoke app or piece of software when there are software as a service products already out there? Well, these are the three reasons that I see time and time again. Firstly, a bespoke solution is completely tailored to you and your business. Instead of you having to change the way you operate around a piece of software, our software will do exactly what you need it to do in the way that you need it to do. 
Secondly, it's an investment. You're not paying for somebody else's intellectual property or paying monthly user licenses. You're developing your own intellectual property. It can be classified as a capex instead of an opex, adding value to your business. And hopefully, in the event of a sale or an acquisition, that value will be passed on. And finally, the government are all about uh, encouraging people to use technology to do what they're doing more efficiently, reducing carbon emissions, that kind of thing. So there are plenty of incentives out there, R&D tax credits, um, smart innovation grants, should you want them. So the trends we're observing, if my clicker works. Unsurprisingly, post-pandemic, there has been a general acceleration in prop tech adoption. According to a recent study, 56% of executives within the commercial property sector are looking to increase the amount they're investing in prop tech. Perhaps that's you. And that's what we've seen um, across the board, but especially within the property sector. Demand for our services is increasing. Now, that said, there are always people who are quicker to adopt new technology than others. <laughs> And one group which has been notoriously slow in adoption is uh, property solicitors. But we have had the immense privilege of working with property solicitors across the country to help them think through how they can do what they're doing more efficiently, more quickly, using technology. We've built um, systems which integrate with their case management systems, um, systems which help to kind of um, bridge the gap between the brokers and the solicitors and the conveyance that they're working with um, and ultimately improve that customer journey because buying a house, getting a mortgage, remortgaging is still one of the most stressful things you can do and there's huge potential for technology to make things easier, for an app to make things easier, for software to make things easier. Technology's not working then. Yeah. <laughs> Demo demons. Anyway, the next... Can we, t can we take the slide on at the back? Can you do that for us? Can we do that? Yep, there we go. There we go. The third trend we're seeing is a demand for increased uh, joined up data systems. So people are getting fed up of having one system over here, maybe it's your HR software, their invoicing system over here, um, their property management software over here. And so they're coming to us to... to ask us to develop apps and software which helps them to provide data to the pe people who need it in the format that they need it. So we've done a lot of work um, with the shared ownership sector, helping them report back to the government on the number of deals that are taking places, um, that kind of thing. We've built um, apps for operators so that tenants can gain access to um, kind of their uh, latest agreements, also they can pay ground rent, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, lots of things. People want joined up systems and uh, portfolio apps as well, being able to provide back to investors on um, their portfolios and what's going on. And finally, and this is the fun one, um, we've heard bits of it today, uh, we're seeing an increased demand for IoT applications, so apps which interface with real world tech, hardware, um, and on this front we've been privileged to work with British Gas on helping them to get smart meter readings out of the hardware and into um, software. Um, which they can use to manipulate that data um, and security companies like Pyronix who work globally. Um, and this is really going to be even more important for ESG, capturing that data that, that you already have and being able to manipulate it and present it back in, to stakeholders in a valuable format. Um, we've also worked with property developers in uh, China who have luxury malls um, and obviously bringing people back into the retail space is more important than ever when we've developed um, apps which interact with hardware installations or lighting installations you can blow on your phone to light up uh, the shop front and that kind of thing. So there is huge potential for prop tech to make what you're doing more efficient, to save you money. It's advancing at an incredible rate, as we've heard this morning, the use of VR, AR, um, it's only going to increase. Um, and if there's anything we can do to help you on that front, we're here all afternoon. This afternoon, we're going to exploring the future of prop tech. Where is it heading? What is the tenant of 20 years time going to be expecting when they're walking around your properties? Um, do come join us for that conversation. Thank you.
Very good. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. And our final seven minute wants you to embrace genuine digital change for both your buildings and your occupiers. What does all that mean? Uh, the answer from Director of Business Development at Local Group, Rob Maxwell. Rob. Piece the clicker. Thank you very much. Ooh, yeah. So, um, thank you for that. Um, when you think about the word tech in real estate, what comes to mind? Fancy acronyms like APIs, SLs, complex diagrams which very few understand, extra expense and time needed, time you need to hire new teams and manage them. I'm sure the list just goes on. Although I work in this sector, I'm not a big fact, a fan of all the fancy acronyms either. And it seems that every meeting I go to these days, there's new ones that we're having to learn. Tech shouldn't be complicated. In fact, <laughs> tech should be simple. The simpler it is, the more effective it can be. It should be simple, it should be easy to use and to deploy. Households and individuals are using tech every day. They use it because it's relevant to them and it solves a genuine problem. Smartphones are a perfect example of that. Simple to use, everything's in one place and with you at all times. So why is the real estate lagging behind so much in some areas? Not all, but some areas. Is it a lack of understanding? What do we need? Why do we need it? Can we justify it? Are questions we get asked all the time. Is it there is so much out there now compared to 10 years ago, we just don't know where to start and decision paralysis is starting to set in? Every day we go into work, we open our inboxes and we're inundated with the most efficient time-saving systems on the market. They all have a place, but when? I believe tech companies should be selling not purely on the, on the, selling purely on the latest advancements. They should also be consulting, listening and working with the real estate sector to understand the real issues from the ground up and start there. In my experience, the senior decision makers within an organisation start the process, but there can be huge disconnects as the message is filtered down to the teams on the ground. The actual end users, the customers question, why are we using this? Why is it needed? What problem is being solved? Was that problem there to start with? Do I understand it? And at the end of the day, who's paying for it? So the first bit of advice would be maybe just turn down the noise in the market a touch and listen to the end users and the customer. The most successful businesses are those that are listening to the customers and the teams. With their, their input, any great advances will be met with questions and reasons of why they have not been f implemented fully. Keep the initial offering simple and completely relevant to the end user. Six months ago, I went to a very large residential development. It consisted of multiple blocks, probably about 650 individual units within it. It was serviced by one concierge desk in the main building and there was huge amounts of amenities, a bit like we saw earlier, the amenities that people have been asking for within the, re in the residential side of things. The question I was asked was, could we place facial recognition into the amenity spaces? So when people walked into these amenity spaces, they didn't need to use their fob or their access card to, to use the cinema or the golf simulator that was in this really flash part of it, or even a meeting room. But again, I have to ask, was that the best place for them to be starting? I needed to understand, or we needed to understand, how the building was being used and take things right back to basics. So we needed to understand what was the process for that particular resident to book that meeting space or that communal amenity. And it was clear that the way the residents were doing it, it was they were ringing up concierge, finding out what the availability was, and concierge would book it on their behalf. We needed to understand the types of residents who were living within the building. We worked out 65% of them were rental and 35% of them were actually owner occupied. How did residents find out that these amenities were in this colossal development that was there? And the answer was, well, there's a welcome pack that the owners received, which would provide them with all the information about the amenities that were there. Word of mouth, people, the community would talk about these amenities and the occasional poster in a lift. That could mean that up to 65% of the residents that were renting rather than owning wouldn't necessarily know that those amenities were there for people to see, use and actually book. Unless you had a kind homeowner that had left the rental pack in the rental pack, that actual welcome guide to start with. 
As I was walking back from looking at all these amenities, we walked past the concierge area and you could see piles of posts and, and boxes behind the desk. I said, is this a common sight in, in, in the building? They said, oh, very much so. Um, parcels are a bit of a bane of our life, really, in this development. It takes us hours daily to notify residents. So again, how are you doing this? Well, there's post boxes and we're putting the notes through people's door to let them know there's a large parcel for them to collect. Well, how long do these, long do these parcels stay, I asked. They said days, sometimes weeks. And in fact, sometimes the residents can come to the mailbox and be a bit cheesed off to find there's three or four reminder slips in their post boxes. So, was facial recognition the right place to start or was it actually a communications platform was the best place to start? We ended up providing them with a centralised portfolio, a portal, sorry, and, and mobile app. Within this portal and mobile app, was the digital welcome pack, some of the information used by Matterport. The information was relevant to each type of resident group, whether it's a tenant or a resident, homeowner and occupier who lives there, or even an investment landlord. The pack was digital, which meant everyone has had real-time access to stuff that was important to them at each stage. They could view the, the amenity spaces, they could understand when they were open, when they were closed, when they could use them. They could see what the availability was and indeed actually book those spaces directly from the portal and from the mobile app. We still haven't touched on the facial recognition. We're probably not going to use the facial recognition side of things. They're going to use their mobile app that comes from Locale to use that to access the door once they're all booked in. We were provided with an efficient parcel notification system. Parcels came in, they were scanned, clients were emailed or residents were emailed and push notifications sent to say the parcel was there. No more pieces of paper, saving that team alone two and a half hours per day of running around buildings putting leaflets through doors. We're now working on, with this development, how we can build on that. So it's about, now it's about understanding what are the residents using these spaces for and how we can future-proof the next step, the next chapter of this building. And also working on community engagement strategies to bring more people together. So, in summary, keep the initial concept and grow it from there. Don't try to do it yourself, choose the right tech partner. Understand their credentials, make sure you understand your requirements and what their requirements would be. Get them to prove the success. Don't be distracted by all the new flashy, shiny tech in the market from day one. It does have its place, but you need to make sure you get the basics right first. Focus on the delivery of the initial stages and make sure you're supported by your tech partner at each stage. Take a step back, not for too long, and start simple. We talk a lot about smart buildings in this industry, so let's make start decisions because the power of effective real estate technology can be a game changer for your business and your customers if done correctly. If anyone's got any questions after this, we'll be at this fancy mural that's been painted in the outside there, and um, I'll be there to answer any questions, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed uh, to, to Rob, thanks to all, to all of our seven minute wonders. Uh, we've got seven minutes uh, <laughs> suitably uh, to, to sort of have a, a, an extra thing because you are all doing round tables, aren't you, after lunch? So another opportunity to ask questions. Then. I suppose um, listening to all of you in your different ways, you were, you were saying you know, we, we need to make life simpler for people. Um, and yet the property solicitor response, putting it another way, is Actually, I'm not sure this does make life simpler. There's so much stuff out there. There are so many competing platforms, so many different apps. And we were talking about joined up. You know, I, I know of housing associations who've invested heavily in one bespoke way of interacting with the maintenance of the building and the, so on. And it doesn't talk to the system that they've got for anything else. And, and actually, there's, a, I think, a, a concern that if you don't know what you're doing, you actually end up making things worse rather than better. Anna, you, you, you talked about joined up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that clearly is the holy grail. But actually, is it really achievable, especially for a, a housing organisation that perhaps already got three or four different systems that don't talk to each other already? Yeah. 
No, I think it is becoming increasingly more achievable. I think everybody's realizing the need for um, shared data. Um, and many systems have, have what are called APIs, which are, enable you to connect and push and pull data in and out of different systems. Um, and we have experience working with a whole variety of APIs, a whole variety of different um, systems. Um, and I think there's a push within technology, uh, as we were hearing about Web3 this morning, about things being decentralized and technology becoming more open source. I think that's the way we're all going to have to go. It'd be lovely if, if it did. But uh, I, I, uh, James, I want to talk to you about virtual twins, because we did, uh, were you able to see the metaverse uh, session we had earlier? Um, it does seem to me that you know, lockdown clearly advanced a, a lot of the thinking around this, that, that virtual twins actually make, makes real sense, and your numbers were very impressive to, to this sector. But again, for, for perhaps people who've been in the sector for a while, have quite traditional views about the way they're going to uh, liaise with their, their residents and, and, and future clients, convince them that virtual reality is not going to be one of these here today, gone tomorrow things, and actually there'll be some new technology further down than that virtual twins, I should say. Yeah. So the way I would think about the metaverse and the talk we had earlier is what is the true business value that you're going to be able to derive? And, you know, it's touched on a little bit. It can't just be a fun place to go. It has, there has to be true business value or use cases that you can take out of the metaverse. And the way that we, we see it is there's still some defining to do of what the metaverse will become. But the reality is it, it actually all starts with digital twins. So having a digital copy of your physical asset is the first step to whether you decide to put that onto the metaverse or you want to use it for internal use cases only, having that digital twin in the first instance is the first step. And, and, and I think the key thing that you were making clear in your presentation is that it's, it's not just about somebody who's interested in renting a flat or whatever, going and having a look round. Right. It, it is about the whole structure. You can use it in many, many different ways. And exactly, and then integrating different uh, functions and features into the digital twin. So whether you know it's Internet of Things to better to live measurements or whether it's just simple annotation of the appliances that are in the property for rental purposes so that instead of having a user manual when you check into your rental property, you have a digital yeah. twin and you can walk over to the washing machine and you have the instructions on how to use it. And then the boiler, how to use it. And that, and that, and actually your point, Rob, you know, keep it simple. Um, I mean, that's the thing. If this makes our lives more complicated, where's the blinking app? How do I get in? Does the, is that picture of me going to work on the thing? You know, I mean, there are times in all our lives when, you know, like even just going on a train sometimes, and you've got it on your phone and you put it on the thing and it doesn't open the thing and, you know, all of that. I guess that's a fear for people that actually they, they go down for the sort of latest or, or singing or dancing bit of technology and then actually it just creates more difficulties and you need to have, you need to be hiring lots of, you know, boffins. Yeah, I think it's about, is it useful? Is yeah. it, actually, you said, is it going to make their life easier? Um, using the Matterport example of home user guides within buildings. Mm. We're, work, we're living in a in, 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 in a world now where it's multi-languages, multilingual people all over the place, all different languages spoken, that sort of stuff. And a lot of the developments we're working at the moment to, to present or to create those, those documents in different languages for people to actually be able to understand it can be costly, time consuming, but with the use of the things like the Matterport 3D stuff and hosting it with a portal such as locales, they can be placed on there and the video that can come from that makes things so much simpler. Yeah. No longer if you're going to be a landlord of a property, if you've got to provide it in maybe three or four different languages, you've got this 3D world directly within the portal, which is giving you a full walkthrough of your, port, of your, of your property and how to use the, how to use the, uh, use the appliance. And we have to be careful we don't leave people behind in this, because there are some, you know, as, as we all get older, actually, our ability to sort of adapt to the new becomes, can, be, can become trickier. Yeah. And we know that older people tend to struggle with this. Mm. Um, so that's, that's important if you've got a, a really mixed you know, client group. Yeah, and I think, I think there's always going to be the need for that physical entity that people can yeah. use. I think it'll always be that. But uh, it dates as soon as it's printed. Yeah. That's the problem with that. And that's why the, the digital side of things is so useful, because you can update these things centrally in one go, rather than having to go, right, there's been a new air uh, conditioning unit put in on three or four different floors within a particular building, and then you've got to 
send that around to every unit within that development to let them know that. You can just do that centrally and it's, it's all changed there for you. Now, I mean, listen to all three of you, it's really exciting the kind of things that are, are available and, and your enthusiasm is, uh, is certainly infectious. Um, as, as we were saying, you're all involved in roundtables. I'm sure many people will have lots of uh, questions, detailed questions, which we haven't got time for now. But for the moment, uh, James, Anna and Rob, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.